Well, I'm Stephen Sen. I'm a consultant statistician based in Edinburgh. I've uh, been an academic, but also worked in the pharmaceutical, statistic, uh, pharmaceutical industry as a statistician. So I've had a varied career and I'm particularly interested in clinical trials. So my talk is, what is your question? Causal and predictive purposes of clinical trials and the implications for analysis. And there's a big danger that I shall confuse myself in giving this talk. And so there's an even bigger danger that I will confuse you. Um, it's sort of in my mind hangs together, but I'm not sure whether I succeeded in making the case, but we'll see at the end of the talk. So just to all, first of all, to thank you for the invitation and to also say that some of this work was funded by the IDEAL project, which was a European Union project developing statistical methods for analyzing treatments for rare diseases. So this is the outline. I'm gonna talk about frameworks and purposes, first of all. Then I'm gonna talk about randomization design and analysis in clinical trials and how they're related. Then I'm gonna say something about personalized medicine, and then I'm gonna try and draw some conclusions. So here are some possible statistical frameworks by which I mean ways in which we sort of imagine that the data arrive uh, and certainly every statistician should always ask themselves, how did I get to see what I see? The way in which the data arise is very important. So one framework, one that we're often taught in methods courses is random sampling. We imagine that the data are generated from a population of interest using probability sampling, most simply simple random sampling, but perhaps some more complicated variant of it. Another uh, method, which is particularly important for designed experiments is randomization data are generated by random assignment of treatments to units. Note that randomization is not the same as random sampling, the two are sometimes confused. Another framework that we use is that of the linear model. We sort of think we have a model for things, it can't explain everything, and so chance enters the model and the outcomes are assumed to have random errors and also a predictable bit. And then the fourth framework that we might have is multivariate analysis. Here, actually, we consider variates varying together and we study certain conditional distributions. We may condition on certain things and see what we can say about other things if we condition on them. Note, by the way, that multivariate is often misused, in particular, I'm afraid to say, by epidemiologists who refer to multi multivariate analysis when in actual fact, they're simply carrying out multiple regression. Multivariate analysis has many left-hand variables. The fact that you have many right-hand variables does not make it a multivariate analysis. So what are the problems and issues to do with this? Well, random sampling is most often taught in elementary courses, I've said. It's got little, if any, relevance to clinical trials. Randomization is simply not used, is, is used rather, but random sampling is never used in clinical trials. And I also happen to think that the idea of treating the patients as if they were somehow representative of some target population is fundamentally misleading. In practice, linear models are often used and they're incorrectly described as being, um, sorry, I've gone onto it as being multivariate. And this is all rather confused. Sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes it does. So there's a further important issue and that is we may sometimes be interested in, in causal inference and sometimes in predictive inference. And here are some examples of the sort of questions that clinical trials can be used to answer. Did the treatment have an effect in these patients? A causal purpose. Did it actually change something? What will the effect be in future patients? That's a predictive purpose. And people sometimes make the mistake of assuming that the first of these questions is simple. Actually, it's not simple. It's not just a matter of descriptive statistics. It's a matter of making an inference about what actually happened to the patients that were in the trial. And unfortunately, in practice, we often get an answer. How often in an analysis of a clinical trial do you actually find the author saying, here we are analyzing a causal question, answering a causal question. Here we're answering a predictive question. They hardly ever say this. Given certain assumptions, they can be answered using the same analysis, but those assumptions are strong and rarely stated. So two purposes. Predictive, the population is taken to be patients in general. Of course, this really means future patients. And you cannot sample at random from the future. It's simply impossible. They are the ones to whom the treatment will be applied. And note, by the way, this is not simply a trivial distinction. You may say, well, you know, why would the patients now be different from the patients in the future? Well, here's an example. They might have a different variant of the COVID virus. We studied them in one variant, but the ones that we now want to treat are actually infected with a different variant. 
We try and treat the patients in the trial as an appropriate selection from this population. It doesn't require them to be typical, but it does require additivity of the treatment effect. We have to have a good scale. We have to have a scale on which we think the treatment effect can be transferred to the target population. And if we have found a good scale, then that implies low heterogeneity of the effect on the scale used. We're looking for ways to eliminate heterogeneity. Causal, we take the patients as being fixed. We want to know what the effect was on these patients. But unfortunately, there are missing counterfactuals. We either treated them, for example, with the vaccine or we treated them with placebo. So what would have happened to uh, patients had they been given the intervention and vice versa? The population is the population of all the possible allocations to the patients. The patients themselves are taken as being fixed. I can try and see if I can get rid of this particular screen, which is making it difficult for me to see on the slides. Yes, okay. Right, so here's an example. I simulated some 95% some confidence intervals from a situation in which the true treatment effect was 300. I calculated the 95% confidence intervals. You can see the parameters there on the, on the particular uh, graph. Uh, and uh, I actually checked to see whether the 95% confidence interval covered the true value or not. If it did, I uh, used a black pen. And if it didn't, I used a red pen. And you could see I did pretty badly. I didn't actually do very well at all. So that's a bit of a shame because after all, uh, confidence intervals are supposed to cover the true treatment effect 95% of the time. What went wrong? Well, I was actually doing a causal analysis but I was using it for a predictive purpose. The true treatment effect was varying from trial to trial. These are 60 trials. There was an average effect over all trials, that's 300, but the actual true treatment effect was varying from trial to trial. What happens if I compare the confidence interval to the true treatment effect? Bear in mind that I am the god of the simulation universe and I know what the truth is. The truth is actually given by the blue bars there, not by the horizontal uh, line that we have on the uh, left-hand side. And there you can see I'm doing pretty well. In actual fact, out of 60 of the confidence intervals, only three, the three red ones here, fail to cover the relevant mean, the mean effect for those particular patients. Of course, I should confess here that I actually cheated. I ran the simulation using different seeds, different initial random numbers, until I got exactly three. But I never got very far from three. Sometimes I got two or one, and sometimes I got five or six or whatever. Basically, I just fix things. So I got a very nice example, three out of 60 being one in 20, which is notoriously 5%. Supposing the heterogeneity was small, supposing the variation from trial to trial was extremely small, then in that case, I would have been able to answer both questions. I would actually have found in that case that the treatment effect for the given trial is pretty similar to the average overall trials. And so the confidence intervals that would cover the treatment effect in that trial would also cover the treatment effect in any future population. And that's the situation on the left-hand side predicted. And it makes hardly any difference on the right-hand side. You can see there's very little heterogeneity. Those blue true effects from trial to trial are scarcely varying from 300. Now, this is, I think, a fairly obvious point, but it's very rarely discussed. People actually very rarely say what they're trying to do in a particular clinical trial. <clears throat> so implications. In general, it's the question that is important. Given certain assumptions, for example, that heterogeneity from trial to trial is low, the same answer can apply to different questions, but this is not always the case. We should be careful in interpreting our answers predictively. And on the application side, whether you run a fixed effects or random effects meta-analysis is a consequence of the question you wish to answer. It is not a matter of whether you found heterogeneity or not. I take the following as a litmus test. If somebody says, we found significant heterogeneity, therefore we carried out a random effects meta-analysis, it simply means they don't understand clinical trials, they don't understand meta-analysis. That just governs the extent to which the answer will differ from a random effect and a fixed effect analysis. But one answers the causal question, the fixed effects, and the other one, answers a predictive question or attempts to, not always very successfully. That's the random effects meta-analysis. Okay, so how does this relate to randomization design and analysis? I'm going to take a famous experiment. Um, this is one uh, rep reported by Hills and Armitage, two well-known medical statisticians. It's a crossover trial in enuresis, so in involuntary urination. <clears throat> 
two sequences, drug placebo and placebo drug, 58 patients measured over 14 days and the number of dry nights are measured. What I'm going to try and do here is compare parametric and randomization based analyses and show that for a causal purpose, it makes little difference, which we use provided that you reflect the randomization. This gives a justification for linear models, by the way, which are flexible parametric approaches. So I don't need to literally believe that the linear model is the right thing to do, but often it will, if I ask the right question, give a very good approximation to what some rather more difficult randomization analysis would show. <clears throat> so these are the data. The dry nights under placebo have been plotted against the dry nights under treatment. The different colors just represent different sequences that the patients had. I'm going to assume that that's irrelevant. And the dashed line going from the bottom left to the top right is the line of equality. Uh, any point which is above and to the left of this line means that the patient in question had more dry nights under treatment than they had under placebo. Uh, on the other hand, if the reverse is the case, uh, if the line is to the right and below the line of equality, then the point rather is below the line of equality, then in that case, the patient had more dry nights under placebo. So what can I say about this? Well, what I did here was I ran two permutation analyses. I simply permutated, permuted the data in two different ways. First of all, I said, well, strictly speaking, the way in which I randomized things was that the patient was simply randomized to a sequence. They were going to get uh, the placebo treatment and they were going to get the active treatment, but it was simply a question of what order they would get them in. And so I simply switched the labels, treatment and placebo, to the actual values that were recorded in the first period and the second period of the trial. And this is the red curve <coughs> that I fitted. That's my fit for the various permuted treatment effects. This is on the uh, particular scale here that you can see, uh, is a two day difference, I think. And you can see the uh, blue diamond marks where we actually were with the clinical trial. That's the value that the clinical trial showed. And you can see it's pretty far out on the red curve. So it's the sort of thing that would not arise just by chance very, very easily. It's very, very far out on the red curve. It's pretty convincing that there was a treatment effect. Supposing I had ignored the fact that this was a crossover trial and I had mistakenly assumed it was a parallel group trial and I had a series of readings for one set of patients treated with placebo and then a series of readings for another set of patients treated under the active treatment and I then carried out the permutation distribution then in that case, I would see the black curve. And you could see that on the black curve, the blue point is the blue diamond is not nearly as impressive. Yes, it's out from the middle, but it's not as far out in terms of the fitted probability distribution as it is for the red curve. So the two permutation sum distributions summarize are as follows. <clears throat> um, if you look at uh, blocking, you actually block by patient sorry, no blocking on the left-hand side, then in that case, you can calculate the p-value simply by calculating how many permuted values will be greater than the actual value observed. And the answer is about 3%, 0 0.0340. So significant, but not highly significant, as we've been taught to say. If you look, however, at the permuted difference blocking, recognizing the fact that we have pairs of observations here one, two observations for every patient, one under placebo and one under treatment, then in that case, the actual result is 0 0.0144, 0 0.0014, sorry. And so that is in fact highly significant. If I use the parametric approach, then I get results which are scarcely different. So on the left-hand side, I've not fitted the patient effect. And what I get is I get a probability uh, p-value of 0 0.0282, which compares very well with the permutation p-value of 0.034. In other words, the randomization analysis, actually the wrong randomization analysis, agrees quite well with the linear model, actually the wrong linear model. Why do I say wrong? Wrong because it doesn't reflect the design. On the right-hand side, we have fitting patient effect, which is what I should have done, because after all, this is a within patient study. And there what I find is I find that the uh, parametric result is 0.00147 for the p-value, and the p-value for the permutation, just to remind you, was 0 0.0014. So remarkably similar. In fact, 
virtually identical. So what are the lessons specific in general? Specific, each subject acts as his own control. What do we control for in doing this? Well, if you think about it, 20,500 genes. That's the current best estimate, I believe, of the number of genes that are in the human genome. So of course the genes don't change if the patient is the same. So the same patient was given placebo and then that patient was given the active treatment and vice versa. Obviously we also control for all life history until the start of the trial and also for a ton of epigenetics. <clears throat> the analysis that reflects this is the correct analysis. The analysis that doesn't is wrong. The point estimate is the same. Standard errors matter. And I'm going to take a swipe at the causal industry here. There are a lot of people in the causal industry who worry all the time about point estimates. And I say, who cares? A point estimate on its own is useless unless you have a standard error. If you're doing causal analysis and your causal analysis doesn't tell you how you should be <coughs> calculating the standard error, whether you should be using the left-hand side or the right-hand side here, then in that case, in my opinion, it's not up to much. Actually, there is a well-established statistical theory which tells you exactly what you should do. General on the right-hand side, contrary to what is con commonly claimed, the standard analysis of parallel group trials does not rely on all factors being balanced. On the contrary, it relies on them not being balanced. Why is that? Well, the whole point is that the black curve here is much wider. Why? Because it's allowing for all the stuff that isn't balanced. The red curve is allowing for the stuff that's balanced. So actually, contrary to what many people say, the standard analysis of parallel group trials does not rely on all factors being balanced. If they were balanced, then in that case, the standard errors would be far too big and the analysis would be wrong. Second point, it makes, a, it makes an allowance for them, and I've already made the point about causal analysis. If causal analysis doesn't consider standard errors, it is misleading at best and wrong at worst. So, so far, we've been looking at average effects. What about thinking smaller? What about thinking about causation and making predictions based on um, individual subjects? We still need to consider counterfactuals. We still need to use controls and we still need to pay attention to variation, but unfortunately there's much slack thinking. So I'm now going to talk about personalized medicine. Here is a report from the Food and Drug Administration, October 2013, and they're describing the number of non-responders there are in various diseases, uh, ranging from depression, where there are not that many, to cancer, where there seem to be rather a lot. And they've illustrated this using, as far as I can see, some Irish dancers and some Scottish dancers. The Scottish dancers are allowed to move their hands and the Irish dancers aren't. Why they did this, I don't know. Anyway, there we are. But already the alarm bells should be ringing. Cancer has a response of 75%. What is cancer? Which cancer has a response of 75%? Actually, if it's lung cancer, that figure, a non-response rather, if it's lung cancer, that figure is far too low. The non-response, if you're talking about five-year follow-up, is much, much higher than that. It's somewhere in the high 90s. If you're talking about testicular cancer, then in that case, that figure should be 0 or 2%. It's virtually defeated is testicular cancer. We now have very good treatments for it. But my, I also wanted to know, where did the FDA get this from? Where did they get this figure from? Well, they actually got it from a paper published in 2001. And again, that's very, very odd. The FDA are trying to tell us what the situation is in 2013. And they go back to a paper that was published 12 years earlier. Don't they think there's any progress in drug development in 12 years? It seems rather odd. But then when I went back and had a look for this paper, I wanted to know where did they get it? Where did Speer, Heath, Kiotzi and Huff get these strange figures that they're quoting from? Well, they got it from here, the physician's desk reference. And this is when I realized that this was utter nonsense. They haven't got a hope in hell. I mean, the paper by Speer, Heath, Kiotzi and Huff has got some interesting points in it, but they have not got any hope at all of identifying those figures from a work like the physician's desk reference for the simple reason that the clinical trials that permit them to do this simply haven't been done. So the real truth is they're zombie statistics. They refuse to die. And I would say that not only is the FDA's claim not right, it's not even wrong 
It's impossible to establish what it might mean, even if it were true. Take the cancer example, for instance. Here's a quote from the British comedian Vic Reeves, 88.2% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Here's another example, another two examples. A Cochrane Collaboration meta-analysis of 2016 uh, took results from 23 studies. There were 6,000 patients in total, and the outcome measure was pain-free by two hours, or substantially pain-free anyway, by two hours. And Corinne Bayen, writing in the Significance, which is the popular uh, statistics magazine, if that's not an oxymoron, uh, of the Royal Statistical Society and the American Statistical Association, um, she explained how Novartis's MCP mod dose finding approach was being used in a trial run by Merck. Uh, they were comparing seven doses and placebo. There were 517 patients in total, and the outcome measure was exactly the same again, pain-free by two hours. But in both cases, the patients were only studied once. And a dichotomy of the continuous measure was made. Patients were labeled as responders and non-responders, and a causal conclusion was drawn that went beyond simply comparing proportions. Bayon talked about the proportion of patients who would respond, and Cochrane talked about the proportion of patients who would make a difference in terms of response. They actually quoted a number needed to treat of 10. So what I propose to do is the following. I'm going to create a statistical model that will mimic the Cochrane result. And in terms of pain resolution, every patient will have the same proportional benefit. In fact, thinking counterfactually, I'm going to make sure that every single headache has the same proportional benefit. But the dichotomy will classify patients as responders or non-responders. I'm going to be able to produce exactly the figures found in the Cochrane review even though in my simulation, every single headache will have had the same proportional benefit and therefore every single patient. But we should be tempted to conclude that some don't benefit and some do, and that this is a permanent feature of each patient. <clears throat> so this is the numerical recipe. I generate page duration for 6,000 headaches treated with placebo using an exponential distribution with a mean of just under three hours. In fact, 2.97 hours to be, to be exact. Each such duration will then be multiplied by just over three quarters, 0.755 to be exact, to create 6,000 durations under paracetamol. So in this world in which I'm the all-powerful god of the simulation universe, I create 6,000 headaches under placebo, and for every single one of these 6,000 headaches, I create a similar headache under paracetamol, but one which has a duration which is one quarter shorter, three quarters of what it was under placebo. I shall then take the 6,000 pairs and I shall randomly erase one member of the pair. That will leave me with 3,000 unpaired placebo values and 3,000 unpaired paracetamol values. I shall then proceed to take the continuous pain duration and do this extremely stupid thing of dichotomizing it, depending upon whether it is longer than two hours or shorter than two hours. Why this recipe? Well, the exponential distribution with mean 2.97 is chosen so the probability response in less than two hours is 0.49. And that's exactly what was seen in the Cochrane review for placebo. If I rescale these figures by 0.755, just over one and three quarters, then it will produce another exponential distribution with a probability response in under two hours. This is the paracetamol distribution. You have to understand here that what has happened is that every single point on the black curve has been created by moving a corresponding point on the red curve. There's no differential response here. And you can see that what this produces is it produces the probability of 0.49 and 0.59, the difference between the two is 0.1. The number needed to treat is therefore 10. And unfortunately, a large number of people who should know better interpret this to mean that the treatment only works for one person in 10. This is quite wrong. Here's an example. Here are some actual values for individual uh, patients here. I've got uh, all of, just a few of them, all those blue circles are the uh, paracetamol duration 
plotted against the placebo duration, and I'm using the two hour duration area um, to indicate where people respond. I've only gone halfway in my simulation recipe. I can't treat the same headache twice. One of the two is counterfactual. I now need to get rid of one member of each counterfactual pair. <clears throat> Here is the counterfactual experiment. This is pain duration on the log scale. And you can see there's a constant difference between the placebo duration, which is a red circle, and the paracetamol duration, which is a blue square. I now randomly erase one member of the pair because I cannot study the same headache twice. I can only study each headache once, either under placebo or under paracetamol. And in fact, here, each patient was only studied once. And you can see that there is considerable overlap between the blue paracetamol durations and the uh, red placebo durations, despite the fact that I know, because I am the God of this universe, that every single headache had the same, patient, same benefit on the log scale, which is to say the same proportional benefit. <clears throat> and these are the two curves produced by simulation. I've got the theoretical curves of the exponential, and I've got the, uh, the thicker lines, which are the empirical curves produced by the simulation. So to sum up, the results reported are perfectly consistent with paracetamol having the same effect, not just for every patient, but on every single headache. Of course, I don't believe this was the case, but the problem is we don't know that it isn't. It's unlikely to be the case, but imagining that we're seeing cases of individual response everywhere is also unlikely to be the case. And we simply cannot tell which is which without designing clinical trials that are meant to do it. The combination of dichotomies and responder analysis has great potential to mislead. Responder analysis, in my opinion, is the work of the devil. If I could see it banned from clinical trials, I would be a happy man. Researchers are assuming that because some patients responded in inverted commas in terms of an arbitrary dichotomy, there's scope for personalized medicine. The problem is that the word response comes loaded with causal connotations it cannot justify. Subsequence is not consequence. You need to think counterfactually. You need to ask the question, what would have happened to this patient had I treated the patient differently? And remember this, it takes dozens, hundreds, and sometimes thousands of patients to tell whether a treatment works at all. How on earth do you expect that we can tell it simply by looking at the results from one patient? This suggests that we could use designs in which patients are repeatedly studied as a means of teasing out personal response. Such designs are sometimes referred to as N of one trials. An example is a double crossover. So what happens here is patients are randomized to two sequences, A, B, or B, A in cycle one, and then again in cycle two, and a simulated example follows. Here I have uh, a treatment in asthma, uh, the difference to placebo in forced expiratory volume in one second, which is a measure of lung function, high values are good. And you can see that the mean result is about 400 milliliters, which is quite a handsome result. Uh, and this mean result is what's seen in the first cycle and the second cycle. Each point on the scattered diagram represents the difference to placebo for both crossovers for a given patient. So for example, we have highlighted there a patient who in the uh, first <coughs> cycle had a value of 93.29, and in the second value, uh, second cycle, a value of 223.7, and that particular patient is plotted there. The color coding is the following. I've used 200 milliliters as being a definition of a response. I hate the idea of a response, but I'm simply playing the game the way that people play it. And what you find is that the blue circles are patients who responded on both occasions. In both crossover trials, they had at least a 200 difference to placebo when given the active treatment. <coughs> the red crosses are the patients who responded on neither occasion. On neither occasion did they have a 200 meter response, 200 millimeter response. And the orange Xs are those who responded on one occasion and not another. And you can see that the correlation is fairly strong. Prediction is not perfect, but we can definitely talk about a response. By the way, the two marginal distributions are plotted here. On the right-hand side, we have the marginal distribution for the second cycle, and then below we have the marginal distribution for the first cycle. <clears throat> 
The results are as follows. This is a cross classification in terms of responder, non-responder using the 200 milliliter threshold. <clears throat> and I can calculate the conditional probability of response. I can estimate in the second crossover. And it is in fact 0.94 if you respond on the first. If you respond on the first crossover trial, if you had a difference of more than 200 milliliters compared to placebo on the first crossover, then there is a 0.94 chance you would have this difference on the second. However, don't give up hope if you didn't respond on the first. There is in fact a 0.31, more than 30% chance that you would respond on the second crossover if you did not respond on the first. This shows how careful you have to be in thinking about these effects as being per permanent or even meaningful. However, I might have seen this particular diagram. Here we have a circular scatter plot. Again, one particular patient is highlighted. That particular patient's values were minus 62. They did better under placebo than under the active treatment in the first cycle. Uh, but 226 or 227 <coughs> to the nearest whole milliliter on the second cycle. Again, we have blue circles responded on both occasions. Again, we have red pluses didn't respond on either occasion. And we have the orange Xs responded on one in one cycle, but not another. Again, we have the marginal distributions shown. Now, if we carry out the responder analysis here to see what this means, having responded on the first cycle, then your chances of responding on the second are 0.89. If you didn't respond on the first cycle, your chances of responding on the second are 0.86. In other words, response simply is not a feature of any given patient. It's just something that happens randomly from time to time. How do we know which of the two is which? Sorry, I've gone on ahead now. That is unfortunate. How do we know which of the two is which without having run two crossovers? The answer is we can't tell, because if you have a look at the uh, marginal distribution on the bottom, which is the marginal distribution we had if we only had one cycle, just a single crossover, then it's pretty much the same as it is in the second case. But the first case shows strong, uh, a strong suggestion that there is some element of personal response. And the second case shows virtually no evidence at all that there is any element of personal response. So <clears throat> I, I wrote a paper on this, so it's published in, in Nature um, nearly three years ago now. now. Probably the best thing about the paper is this cartoon, which I rather like. Here we have the good ship drug development trying to navigate its way to the island of personal response, but there are fearsome monsters in the way. We've been promised a personalized medicine revolution for over 25 years ago. It's about 25 years ago that I left the pharmaceutical industry and it was about the time when all these promises were being made. The revolution, if it is coming, still seems to be a long way ahead. And I sort of sarcastically say that personalized medicine is something that's going to happen the year after next. And this is always true. In this paper in, in Nature, I argue that the scope for personalized medicine has been greatly exaggerated. And one of the reasons is naive interpretation of observed variation. Uh, all sorts of things are misinterpreted and top of the list, I'm afraid, are numbers needed to treat. If Cochrane could ban numbers needed to treat from the analysis that they do, that would be a great service to the whole of mankind. End of one trials is one way we could do better. So limitations. Of course, it's only possible for chronic diseases. We're not in the resurrection business. You can't treat patient again, patients again with the alternative treatment if they've died, for example. So for many diseases, replicating treatments is not possible. Some progress may be made by using repeated measures, but that requires strong assumptions, studying variances, comparing variances in treatment and control groups and looking at subgroups. And the key to all this is thinking in terms of variation and also thinking in terms of distributions. Just thinking in terms of point estimates is not good enough. So wrapping it all up. Modeling. The statistician should look for scales for analysis that are additive and not necessarily clinically relevant. This is a way in which we can maybe hope to transfer the results from the clinical trial to what happens in practice. I think that um, the vaccine efficacy scale, for example, which was used by all of the major companies in their vaccine development programs, is a much, much better way of 
<coughs> translating the results to what would happen in practice than other scales one might propose. And in particular, the risk difference scale and its reciprocal, the numbers needed to treat, would be a disastrous scale to use in analyzing those clinical trials. This may require real world data. We may need real world data in addition to the clinical trial data that we've got, the analysis we've done in the clinical trial in order to do the translation result, translation work. A lesson from quality control assurance, uh, Deming and others who worked on quality control during the Second World War and in the period just after, realized that one of the problems is that managers tend to interfere too much in systems which are just purely stochastic. They're just varying randomly and there's nothing they can do. And if they start interfering in the system, they actually add to the variation. <coughs> and it's a question I ask people is, what do they actually think the biggest source of variation is in the healthcare system? Is it patients or doctors? And plausibly, it's actually doctors. If we could simply get medics to agree on some average, of policy, average good policy, uh, which was a good policy, and then implement it, then there would be considerable benefit, in my opinion, for treating patients. Let's walk before we run. Let's actually do the job of treating patients on average well before we try and personalize everything. We need much more emphasis on components of variation and biostatisticians should spend more time discussing these issues with life scientist colleagues. We biostatisticians have absolutely no excuse for not understanding this. We should make it our job to make sure that the life scientist colleagues we have also understand it and stamp on them if they suggest that they see personal variation, but they haven't backed it up with, with the rigorous statistical analysis. So, Further lessons, paradoxically embracing random variation can lead to more precise results. Statistics abounds with examples, uh, recovering information in incomplete block experiments, that's another lecture. Being Bayesian, I usually work as a frequentist, but I have to confess I agree, yes, the Bayesian approach in principle allows you to, to, to be more efficient. Not over-interpreting data, penalized regression, these are all examples. We should be wary of looking for bedrock causal explanations of everything. You can believe that somehow it's bedrock, but you'll never know enough to make that particular uh, belief useful. So you should accept that random variation is a large part of everything that happens, including variation within patients. Patients vary from day to day, even though they're the same patient with the same disease being given the same treatment. Much so-called personalized medicine has overlooked this. Components of variation matter, um, I have a, a freely available paper um, on uh, mastering variation, which discusses exactly what we need to do. Standard errors matter. If you're simply producing point estimates without producing standard errors, and if you're not thinking about what context that standard error is valid for, you're not doing your, your job as a statistician. So do questions. Think about which questions are being answered when you do an analysis, which questions matter, which questions are you trying to answer. Thank you for your attention. So uh, the first question, Stephen, was uh, actually, it was from Kip Byatt and uh, he asks, um, can you clarify the difference between multivariate and multivariable, please? So multivariable is when you have uh, lots of predictors. So you might be looking to predict blood pressure as a function of um, age, weight, height, and other physical characteristics of the patient. Multivariate is when you have uh, things varying together on the left-hand side. So you might be trying to jointly model systolic and diastolic blood pressure as a function of these things. In that case, it's multivariate or bivariate in that particular case, but you know, maybe you can include blood, uh, pulse as well or something like that. So basically it's when you are trying to predict many things together or you're looking at many things varying together, that's multivariate. Okay, great. And then we have two questions that came through actually um, prior to your talk. So um, they were from <coughs> our reg at registration. So, I mean, if they're not, you know, appropriate, then please let me know. And, um, but the first person asks, depending on causative or predictive, how uh, the core variate we include in the model change? So sorry, that's a little bit uh, rough, but how will the covariate in the model change? Well, if you have an additive scale, then in that case, it wouldn't change much, but it's quite possible that you can't get an additive scale. And in that case, 
for the purely uh, causal uh, analysis, the covariates that you have for a given particular uh, population are fixed and they might not matter. And you might not care too much about the effect and essentially it's their joint effect that matters. Uh, suppose you have a clinical trial in which all the patients in the clinical trial are either um, young women or old men. I mean, it's ridiculous that this would happen, but just suppose it's the case. Clearly in that particular clinical trial, you're not gonna be able to distinguish the effect of uh, age from that of sex. The two are pretty strongly confounded. Um, so, uh, however, um, for a causal question of whether the patients benefited in that particular trial it doesn't matter because those patients are fixed patients. So their covariates are not gonna change. And of course you can control for those covariates and you're looking at uh, whether the treatment made a difference for the patients. And in that case, you're effectively saying, you know, you're matching by the patients. And if you can't distinguish the effect of sex from the effect of age, it doesn't matter because it's their joint effect that matters for that causal question. However, if you're now gonna apply the results to a future population, it may well be in that particular population, in addition to being young, to having young women, such as you have in your particular clinical trial, you also have old women. And in addition to having old men, such as you had in your trial, you also had young men. Then in that case, you would need to know something about the effect of age and sex. And in particular, if they were somehow effect modifiers, you would have to know what goes on to know what the effect would be in the population you're looking at. So it's more difficult. Uh, and you can also think of cases where maybe there are some particular, some particular covariates which are really very, very important for um, looking at the uh, population uh, which are not relevant in the particular clinical trial you looked at. You could have a uh, you could have a clinical trial in um, uh, healthy volunteers, in which case the uh, renal status of the healthy volunteers, a pharmacokinetic trial, the renal status is scarcely relevant um, because they'll all have good kidneys. But uh, if you want to say something about the uh, concentration, the area under the curve for patients who have been treated in future, then some of these may have impaired kidneys. And then in that case, it suddenly becomes an important thing to know something about. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then we got another question from somebody from uh, Gambia. <coughs> How can the validity of using indirect treatment comparisons, indirect evidence for decision making in network meta analysis be improved given that the use of such evidence is particularly challenged when direct treatment comparisons are also available? Well, I suppose if you had enough uh, good quality evidence for direct comparison, you wouldn't need to use the indirect one. Um, it's clear that um, the comparison that is made in a network meta-analysis does sort of reply on some sort of constancy effect for it to be relevant. Um, and that's a problem. This is a very, very old problem. I mean, uh, basically network meta-analysis is nothing more than incomplete blocks analysis, which was studied in the agricultural domain from the 1920s onwards. So it's been rediscovered uh, towards the end of the last century by uh, people doing meta-analysis, but essentially the, there's an extensive, very, really extensive um, theory of this. Um, which um, recognized a long, long time ago, at least as early as the 1950s, in fact, that the constancy assumption was important. And we maybe ought to pay more attention to this. I don't know, really, I'm just waffling on here. I think it's a problem. Um, I think applied statistics often involves a bias variance trade-off, and this is clearly one. Uh, you would get a notionally more precise estimate by including the indirect evidence with the direct evidence. <coughs> Whether this is worth it or not depends really on how much direct evidence you have. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then I think we have a question from Jorge who asks, when someone understands the rationale of multi-level multi meta-analysis, three levels or more, and we realize that a random effect meta-analysis is actually a two-level, multi-level MA meta-analysis, that does not mean that all fixed effects MAs uh, would be poor. Re Does this mean that all fixed effects meta analysis 
would be poor representation of reality, question mark, or the augment of causal versus predictive would be more important than those details, question mark. Well, I mean, I think you can justify a fixed effect meta-analysis as an attempt to answer the question, did the treatment have, a, have an effect in the patients that were studied? The patients that were studied were studied in a number of trials. How do we summarize? How do we answer that question using all those trials? I think a, a fixed effect meta-analysis is perfectly valid for that particular question. Um, if you want to go beyond that and you want to say, well, you know, what would the effect be in future circumstances, then perhaps you ought to try and generate some sort of variability, which would cover that future circumstance. And a sort of, um, the only way that you can do it perhaps is to look at the variation between the trials. So the excessive variation compared to the fixed effect analysis gives you some idea for this. But of course, effectively, you're assuming that the trials that you have run are exchangeable in some way with the study or the practice that you might have in the future. And that doesn't have to be the case. You could be a real cynic and say, well, that is a component of variation that I simply cannot estimate there. And that's the difference between the current trials and the future context in which I will apply the treatment. I tend to be sort of um, pra pragmatic or optimistic on this. I say, yes, all that's true, but in the end we have to make choices and if we found that a treatment is useful in the patients that were studied, that strikes me as being a good reason for using it. Uh, using the treatment that was found to be less useful in the patients that were studied would be a perverse way to go about things. So in particular, where you're comparing two active treatments and one has shown itself to be better in a series of studies, not using it simply because you can't prove it will always be better strikes me as being perverse. Okay, great. And uh, so he actually has two follow up questions. Um, do you recommend using the wording of the title of your presentation, causal or productive, in the titles and introduction of your papers to frame our purposes? Well, I mean, I'm not, not necessarily, I'm just trying to organize my thoughts here in one particular way. And I think that's one way in which you can do it. Um, uh, I also think that the data generating mechanisms are important. And so the other, the four way classification that I have, you know, is treating, thinking about simple random sampling, thinking about randomization, thinking about linear models, thinking about multivariate analysis. These are different frameworks, which I think are quite useful as well. And so basically um, thinking about that and thinking also about cause and predictive purposes, but there are other questions in, you know, I have a paper called Add of Value from, of Values from about 2004, I think, <coughs> where I give a whole list of possible questions you might want to have answered from a, from a clinical trial. <coughs> and if you're very, very lucky, a single analysis would, would answer them all, but in general, it won't. So it's just a framework for thinking about things, but there are other frameworks people could use. Uh, I think just in general, they should be wary about this idea that a clinical trial is representative of general practice. It isn't, and it shouldn't be. Okay, great. And uh, he then asked, so given this is a hypertension group in RCTs, do you think it's a waste uh, to use an average three uh, blood pressure measurements in an uh, ANCOVA model instead of using those three measures as pre and post in a mixed model? Well, um, I don't know. I have a paper from about 2000 with... Uh, Chattaverdi and Stevens, um, Nish Chattaverdi, Linda Stevens, which uh, discusses the summary measures approach and shows that under certain circumstances, it actually gives you the same answer as a mixed model approach. Um, there, there are other issues which are more important in my, my opinion. One of them is um, if you use a mixed model approach or if you use a summary measures approach, you have to be very, very careful as to what sort of summary measure you use or what sort of mixed model you use, because you can easily end up violating the intention to treat. I think this thing has been generally overlooked. If you use a random slopes model, it's clear that to a certain extent, what you're doing is you're correcting later post-randomization measurements using earlier post-randomization measurements. This is hidden in the mixed model, but this is actually a violation of intention to treat you're not allowed to use post-randomization covariates because you're conditioning on things you cannot know at the time 
that you are actually choosing which treatment to make. It may well be okay given certain strong assumptions in particular that the linearity holds, but you can easily get, get, uh, go wrong. And in my opinion, it would be a good idea if people tried more often to use an approximation, using the summary measures approach, try and work out what summary measures approach would in fact be similar to the mixed model that they're using and then see what happens. And in particular, study the weights that the mixed model approach would give you that would, co would correspond to the summary measures approach. People don't do this often enough. And the trouble is, is the magic is hidden. It's hidden in prop mix if you're a SAS user or you know, whatever it is in, uh, in R or whatever. Um, and I think that mixed models are potentially dangerous. Um, <clears throat> but of course, it's a very powerful technique. So one should be careful. I probably didn't answer your question. I'm sorry. Okay, but maybe you could share these uh, your your two um, papers that you said. Maybe when we're going to send out uh, the recording, the announcement of the recording, maybe we can actually add these papers to our. Yeah, sure. I'll try and try to remind myself um, what 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 I was talking about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It was like the added values, 2004. Yeah, paper. summary measures. Yeah. And then at the end of my talk, I also measured, the, I mentioned the mastering variation one. Great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, still quite a few questions, actually. So, um, hey, is, are you okay? Are you okay with the going yeah, over Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. No, no, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so from Tom Perry, ask much. What was over my head, but I wonder how we should explain to colleagues and patients the probability that a week, uh, weekly efficacious drug will work. For example, an antidepressant for major depressive disorder, an analgesic for chronic pain. Often the original data are collected from ordinal scales, then parametric uh, statistics performed as if the results were real numbers. Is that <coughs> Would you, uh, why would reporting a mean difference between groups be better than trying to report the percentage of people who get a really useful clinical response? Well, I mean, the, the, the question, the problem is with the, re, the weasel word response. If by response you mean was observed to be better having been treated, yes, that's okay. If by response you mean was caused to be better by treatment, then that's an unjustified use of the word. You don't know that. You don't know that because you don't have the counterfactual for the given individual. You simply don't know what would have happened to them. That's point number one. Point number two is doing this sort of dichotomization is very destructive of information. And also, I mean, I had a PhD student who was a working in uh, a stroke medicine, uh, uh, but also was looking at um, the risk of diabetic patients having stroke medicine. And she found a number of studies have been carried out, but basically people were using different dichotomies as to what it was to be diabetic and different dichotomies as to what was a good outcome for stroke. And over a reasonable sized number of studies, there were no two studies that had used the same combination of both. And yet people will talk about these things. They'll say things like, if you're diabetic, your probability of response in Stoke is blah, blah, blah. Um, whereas in actual fact, they don't even know what they're talking about. They don't even know what it means because different people are using arbitrary dichotomies. But as I say, in any case, it's damaging. We have better methods. You should use a proportional odds model probably rather than uh, dichotomizing the data. Okay, great. So uh, Harlan Campbell asks, uh, for a random effects meta-analysis, what is your opinion on the recommendation by some to report prediction intervals rather than confidence intervals? No, I think that's a mistake. I mean, I think that's a mistake because it's to do with the random variability in the future trial, unless I misunderstand the question. Um, you should be seeking to predict what would happen in the infinitely large future trial. Okay. Um, and but I mean, and obviously, if, if you've got, <coughs> yeah, so I, wouldn't, uh, <coughs> I wouldn't think that's a, <coughs> a good idea necessarily. I suppose, I mean, the point is that you don't, well, I don't know. I have to think about that. 
yeah, we I'll can have also to think about I have to think about with, that some uh, more. If you want to think about it, you could just kind of maybe answer that question in the email too. Yeah. You mean I, for a randomly chosen, a randomly chosen, infinitely large future trial? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose you could do that. Okay, if you have uh, questions too the, for follow up, I mean, would you be open to people like contacting you in person? <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. Okay, so yeah, if you would like to follow up, Parlin, you could do that as well. Okay, so Kit asks, should we use different analytical methods for acute conditions comparing with long term ones? Well, I mean, um, different diseases do require different methods. In, in general, I think that's true. You, you have to think about what's appropriate for the particular uh, disease area that the clinical trial is being run in. And that will also cover differences like that. Yes, there should be um, different approaches. There are some cases where survival analysis is appropriate and some where it isn't. And yeah, I, I think that's probably true. Um, okay, then he asks, should we be looking at relative changes rather than absolute changes if there's a nonlinear distribution of a variable as in duration of headache? Probably you should be looking at, um, you should be looking at, uh, often it's better to look at proportional effects, often. But I mean, I don't think, I think one can't generalize. It, it does depend, but it often is better. Um, one should avoid using clinically relevant scale simply because they're clinically relevant. You should translate to the clinically relevant scale when you have sufficient covariate information to do so, but not try and uh, fit every clinical trial into that straitjacket. Um, I mean, I often put it like this, I give the example of road traffic accidents. So road traffic accidents is velocity is really important. Um, if you crash at a higher speed, then the survivability is less. Uh, and in fact, if two vehicles crash into each other, then the, the net velocity is an important feature of survivability. However, if you talk to any physicist, they will tell you that uh, Newton's laws are in terms of acceleration and mass, not velocity. And uh, furthermore, uh, uh, to which you might answer, well, that's all very well, but actually cars have uh, speedometers on them. So measuring velocity, they don't have uh, acceleration is not what people pay attention to, they pay, they pay attention to velocity. So what you should do is you should reformulate Newton's laws. Well, that's completely ludicrous. Anybody who's competent can translate Newton's laws, although they're couched in terms of acceleration and mass and force into a consequence in terms of momentum, which depends upon velocity. It's not a reason for changing Newton's laws. Similarly, it's not a reason for changing the analysis of clinical trials. You found a good way to describe what the effect was for patients in clinical trials, a good scale. Then in that case, you should seek to translate that to something that is clinically relevant when it comes to be applied. Um, so a particular example, I think, is, uh, you know, the, uh, if you've got a proportional hazards model and the model seems to fit well, then in that case, you shouldn't be looking to report things in terms of median survival or numbers needed to treat. This is a really, really bad idea. <clears throat> you should stick with the hazards model. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So um, Fernando asks, thanks for a wonderful talk. Has there been an illustrative example of personalization that overcomes the challenges that you've raised, one that works? Well, there have been some uh, successes, yes, indeed. Um, so, for example, um, Andrew Hattersley and uh, co-workers uh, discovered a monogenetic variation variant um, for people suffering from type 1 diabetes, which meant they could actually be treated as if they had type 2 diabetes. So that's a terrific benefit for those patients. You know, they can use a sort of medicine that would apply for type 2 diabetes. So that's a, an example of a success story. There are other success stories. I'm not saying there haven't been any success stories, but uh, you and Cameron, I think was the other, um, was it Cameron? Uh, was the other person who was, uh, who was involved in that, the other main uh, PI. But um, 
so there certainly have been some successful cases, some successful uh, examples also in, uh, in cancer with in particular genetic mutations and so forth. But um, there have also been uh, diseases, uh, I think sometimes overlooked, where basically the treatments that have been discovered work for everybody. In my own lifetime, I would nominate the treatment of um, ulcers of the digestive tract as being one of the great success stories of medicine. And that involved, uh, first of all, the development of H2 antagonists, then of proton pump inhibitors, the realization that many cases were due to H. pylori infection, the development of a breath test that could test that whether you had H. pylori infection or not, and the development of successful antibiotic. And those five wonderful things together, uh, but starting already with the, 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 the new generation of antacids, made an enormous difference to basically diseases that were just a job for the surgeon and not very well done by the surgeon inevitably. So, and that works for nearly everybody. There's not much need for personalization in that field. Great, thank you. So um, Kit asks again, surely personalized medicine might, be, might best be done using a drug for which there's some evidence for benefit and doing an end of one trial in the individual. The major problem is getting hold of placebo tablets for this. Maybe pharma companies should always be required to make placebo versions for each product they make. Well, um, in a sense they are. They're supposed to make placebos. Uh, for example, if uh, GlaxoSmithKline run a trial against a Novartis product, Novartis product, they will buy the placebos for the Novartis drug from Novartis and vice versa. And if the particular pharma company didn't, wasn't prepared to provide them, they would get in trouble with the regulator. So they basically are done, but whether they are available at a reasonable price for independent researchers to use is another matter. I don't really know. But certainly all the time, the standard way of running uh, drug to drug comparisons is using the double dummy technique. So the, the GSK patients will have, in addition to the GSK drug, they will have a placebo to the Novartis drug. And those being given the Novartis drug, in addition to the Novartis drug, will have a placebo to the GlaxoSmithKline drug. That's the way that it's done. And uh, so basically there are placebos for all the drugs. Great. Um, so, and then uh, Cuckoo says, um, this is basically with like some more resources. So it, it, on top of the, 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 your papers that you mentioned, like if you have any further reading that, that could kind of help people um, in their learning you know, um, trajectory, she would appreciate that. Well, it, oh, go ahead. It, it might be worth having a look at my blog site. Uh, my last slide had the, uh, the blog address on. There are a number of blogs there. I've also been um, trying to draw to people's attention that the, um, the experimental calculus that John Nelder developed um, for design experiments in 1965, and which is incorporated in GenStat, is extremely powerful and revealing for a number of causal questions. Um, and I actually think that some of the people who are doing great work on, on causal analysis would do well to have a look at it. It could make um, DAGs and things like that even more powerful if these particular insights were incorporated. In particular, I think the treatment of random effects is not well done by most people doing causal analysis. Um, but basically, all grown up statistics has random effects. Okay, one way or another. Great. So they should basically go to your blog. So um, I'll, I'll put that in the chat once, you, uh, once you're talking about this next question. So um, Professor Sen, why do you think any articles suggest to use random effects meta-analysis to account for heterogeneity? Cochrane's, Higg uh, Higgins articles, et cetera. I appreciate your point of view, i.e. to focus on the research questions regardless of heterogeneity. Yeah, I'm, I'd be surprised if Julian Higgins does actually suggest that. Um, he's a pretty savvy guy, and I would be surprised. I think that what you find sometimes, I mean, Cochrane, um, Cochrane was great when it was started, but I think the problem is um, that further down the line, people didn't realize that empowering the people who were not well educated in statistics to carry out statistical analyses 
although a great way to get the necessary analyses done and off the ground initially, in the long term was not a good way to proceed. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of, you know, sort of, I, I don't know, uh, I, have, I have this love-hate relationship with Cochrane. I sometimes sort of imagine the typical Cochrane reviewer reading the risk of bias tool in a way that you can actually see their lips move. That's rather unkind, you know. But, but I sort of think, is this really what it's about, you know? Um, there are lots of, uh, lots of issues to do with analysis. It's not just a question of stuffing things into the sausage machine and cranking the handle and then worrying about the risk of bias, blah, blah, blah. There's actually quite a lot of difficult analysis that needs to be done. Um, and I, I think sometimes not enough credit is given to the difficulties. Um, so I'm not, I'm not so sure. I, I think a lot of uh, people who are important contributors to the methodology of uh, meta-analysis know perfectly well that the distinction between a random effects and a fixed effect meta-analysis is not whether there's heterogeneity. It's just that they give the same answer if there isn't heterogeneity. But there's still a distinction between them based on purpose. Great. Um, and then uh, Jakob asks, am I correct that results from fixed effects models should be formulated in the same tense? Uh, for example, drug significantly decreases LDL C level, while random effects gives possibility <coughs> to use more general statements <coughs> in present tense. It, for example, drug decreases LDL C level. Well, uh, yes, although it has to be understood that the random effect meta-analysis is much more ambitious. Um, and the question is whether the variation that you see from study to study in the studies you happen to have, which you didn't plan in the first place anyway, they were just planned by a bunch of different people and you have, that's, those are the data you happen to have, whether that variation really describes what the variation is in future studies. <coughs> I think there are also some practical reasons as to why the variation may sometimes, heterogeneity may sometimes be overstated. Uh, a lot of um, early Cochran reviews, and in particular ones carried out by health economists, tended to worry a lot about demographics. You know, was it a good idea to have uh, the elderly and the young in the same analysis, but not at all about molecules? So, you know, they would do a meta-analysis in which, you know, all hypertensives are put in together or, you know, at least all, all beta blockers or, you know, whatever. Um, whereas from my experience in, in the uh, pharmaceutical industry, I've had my fingers burnt on twice occasions, on two occasions rather, simply because the formulation of the same molecule was not equipotent. On one occasion, a different formulation had a quarter the potency of an existing formulation. So formulations, Doses, molecules, matter, and changing those will contribute to heterogeneity. And one then has to ask oneself whether a random effect meta-analysis incorporating that heterogeneity is reasonable or whether in instead we should split the trials into uh, very, very strict um, treatment definitions. Great example, actually. <laughs> And then the final question, I think, is uh, in meta-regression analysis, do we focus on causal rather than predictive? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. I should have said at the beginning, I prefer easy questions to difficult ones. <laughs> I, I'd have to think about that. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. It's been and actually, I really want to thank everybody for uh, for such great questions, actually, which, uh, you know, it's going to make us. Think and I've learned so much from your presentation. So thank you very much. Um, and then one person just says as a kind of thank you note at the end, much of this was above my head, but I'm better for the experience. Thank you for all health and wealth of happiness to you. So yeah, thank you very much. Okay, it's a pleasure.